All right, so this is real now. <laughs> Although the art form seems like a bright idea, what if I were to tell you that it came from a really dark place? In 2009, I lost my father, my best friend, and half of the family was severed. And I went into a deep depression. But in this depression, I found my source of inspiration was, was art, and it was a form of therapy for me. But also, in this form of therapy, it was, it was very sedentary, where I found myself sitting inside a lot. And uh, I found that it started to become more of an enemy than uh, actually helping me get through the process of, of recovery. And so I started to uh, envision myself while I was creating art. I started imagining how I could be outside doing this right now. I could be absorbing the sun rays. And I didn't have to fall deeper and deeper into the darkness and surround myself with myself too much. And so I knew I had to make a change. And I had to strip myself of everything that I knew, everything that I knew in terms of creativity. I wanted to go back to the basics. And uh, I knew the only way that I could do that was to get up and go, and go to a place that was completely opposite of all of this. And so I, I booked a one-way ticket to uh, South Korea, a country I really knew nothing about. And I had only one objective, to travel west for as long as I could. And uh, after a couple months, I started to get back aches because you realize when you're carrying your life on your back, that shit gets heavy, you know? <laughs> and. Um, I knew, obviously, at this point, the juxtaposition, juxtaposition was that I, I didn't shed enough weight. So I had to reassess my pack. And um, <laughs> I knew that I couldn't get rid of my sleeping bag or my tent. Those were my essentials. But I had another pack full of my creative stuff. And I started thinking to myself, is there something that I could use that could incorporate all the tools that I grew up with, all the paintbrushes and the pencils? And just like out of a scene from a movie, there was a magnifying glass sitting on the table. And the light shone through the window. And I knew at that moment, this was what I was looking for. And maybe it was because I left that I finally got to notice this, this device that was in front of me my whole life. And so I went out without a doubt to try it out. <laughs> that all rhymed, right? <laughs> and um, I luckily had a camera there to film it. And this was the first piece I ever created with the sun. And if I'm looking at it just from the perspective of somebody who's never seen it before, to me it looks like somebody who knows what they're doing and has maybe done this art form before. And this is where I believe in the power of, of memory and the power of past lives, that I believe I did this art form a long time ago. And I was just remembering it at this point. And so this uh, was the beginning of a 14-month journey across the Silk Road, which is an ancient trade route that connects Europe with Asia. And it was here where I, um, I honed in on this craft. I tried to refine it. But because I met so many um, misfortunate people that were caught up in, in war and famine and injustice. Um, and they were so kind to me. These people on, along this road, these people are so kind. And it's so sunny. The, the more you, you move into that middle area called Afghanistan, the friendlier they get. And so I realized I had to pay them back. And this was my chance to practice gratitude. And why not use the sun to to give to give them as a form of payment. So I began creating art for everyone along that route that ever helped me with anything, just in kindness or sincerity or generosity. And uh, in 2013, in the beginning of summer, I returned back to the US and I moved to Colorado. And I knew nothing about Colorado. I just moved there on a whim. And when I got there, I realized how similar the landscape of Colorado was to Afghanistan. 
And so I started looking at the map. Maybe it was because Denver and Kabul, they lie on the same latitude. Maybe it's because they're similar distance from sea level. Or maybe it's because they share the same sun. And maybe they're just as close to the sun. And um, this made me feel nostalgic for my trip because it had been a year and I hadn't touched the magnifying glass since I got back. So I started creating art this time, but for myself. And all the pieces reflected what I had experienced on my trip, mostly about women and children unfortunate enough to be born into these situations. And I started creating art to kind of show people in Colorado that, hey, the landscape of this beautiful place looks just like a landscape of somewhere else, and the only difference is one of them is at war. And um, I also started creating art about recreation, because in Colorado, everybody loves recreation. Um, whether it be snowboarding, skiing, they always make time to enjoy themselves. And I started to imagine a world where, what if we used our recreation time to actually stop war or stop famine or stop violence? And that's what this piece is about right here. And so as the pieces uh, became more intricate, I, I needed to develop a new set of tools because a single magnifying glass wasn't cutting it. So I started building these two-handed ambidextrous tools that were kind of reminiscent of maybe like a rake or a, a paddle, you know, something that felt familiar. And this allowed for more stability. It allowed for me to hold the lens up for longer periods of time. I also started making tools that worked with nature. This one has wings, and if you hold it up at the right angle to the uh, wind, it kind of flies, and it will help to keep that paintbrush up in the sky a little bit longer. I also um, got ambitious to start collecting more light, and I discovered these giant lenses called Fresnel lenses, which you'll find in flat screen televisions. And these are what allowed me to paint mural sized works pretty much anywhere and um, under any lighting circumstance, because the more light you can collect, the um, less clarity you need in the sky. And so I began, once I, um, once I felt like it was safe enough to start showing this to the public because the light is extremely bright, there's a lot of smoke, and um, you are drawn to it no matter what because when you see it, it looks like a second sun. So I started performing at different events and uh, I started filming it. This time I would set up um, my GoPro and do time lapses. And when I would look at the footage later on, after I was done, I realized the beauty wasn't in the artwork. The beauty was in the life that was going on around it, and that the art was just kind of the evidence of that. And so I would set up in these locations, and I would capture all this life that was happening around, and I felt like that was the important part. And uh, then I started to feel like the camera was almost more important than the tool itself, than the, the magnifying glass itself. And uh, once I knew I was onto something, I started to see if this art form could be a voice for peace and justice. So I attended a refugee rally in Denver in 2017, and I created an image of Syria with, the, with a mirror facing the sun around 15,000 people. And, um, it was incredible, and it was, it was loud. It was, it was a way to get, some th get a message across that was, we're normally, um, we normally have the freedom to just turn away from. You, you can't turn away from this because it's as bright as the sun. And then I also began to realize the importance of this being a performance art more than it being just a final product. And uh, I started posting a lot of videos online, and I was getting approached by major brands to do um, advertisements, experimental advertisements, kind of based on, on nature and um, green, green uh, practice. And funny enough, the two first companies that ever contacted me were cigarettes and scotch. <laughs> <laughs> And 
And so, okay, so how does it work? How do we paint with the sun? Um, if you've ever used a magnifying glass when you were a kid, you know that there's a little bright dot that can burn leaves or ants. <laughs> but there's more to it. When, when, we, when we put it against a dark background, we find that it's actually a three-dimensional uh, cone-shaped or hourglass uh, ecosystem. And the focal point lies right in the middle. And that focal point, you can imagine as being the tip of the paintbrush. And that focal point is invisible to us, to the naked eye. It, it only shows itself when something uh, passes through it, like ice, water, or smoke. And one of the most interesting parts was after even three years of doing this, I didn't realize this, um, but if you look, there's blue light on the left and there's red light on the right. And um, this is because of refraction. When light goes through a, uh, a clear lens, it slows down. And when it exits the lens, it speeds back up. But they speed back up at such different angles that they split. And this right here is reminiscent of why the sun is blue, or why the sky is blue in one direction or red in the other direction. It's because it's all relative to where you are compared to the source of light. And this can be taught to children all over to, as a simple explanation of when they, if they ever ask you why the sky is blue. Uh, and it works with many things. It doesn't just work with lenses. It works with water. This is uh, an experiment with just a simple glass of water holding very still. It also works with ice. It also works with mirrors, a magnification mirror that you might have in your uh, bathroom. And so you're probably wondering, how did I figure all this out? You know, was there somebody that showed me? Was it something that was innate inside of me? Uh, the more I researched, the more I realized there was nothing new under the sun. The 1936 Olympics uh, was lit by a parabolic mirror in the sun as is the Olympic torch today still being lit by the sun. And th so these are modern day Olympics and they, their influence was to do this practice to, to light it with the sun was um, based on an ancient Greek myth that said Prometheus stole the power from Zeus and lit a torch from the sun and brought it back again to mankind. So when I read this, I was thinking, are they talking mythology or are they talking like literally? And one of the greatest examples is uh, Archimedes of Syracuse, who was a mathematician. He was um, ordered to create a defense weapon to burn incoming Roman ships almost 3,000 years ago. And so he devised a giant mirror to reflect sunlight in order to protect the invasion of Syracuse. And interestingly enough, another crazy Greek in 1973 wanted to replicate this to see if it was actually possible. And Yanni Sarkas, he um, discovered that it was possible, but not with the use of one mirror, with the use of many mirrors. And what he did was he, he gathered 150 people from his town to hold up giant mirrors, body-sized mirrors, to focus the light onto a single point from nearly 500 feet away, and they were completely successful at doing it. And so I started thinking, where have we seen this before? Where have we seen a bunch of mirrors focusing light onto a single point? And it was here where I realized that the power was not in the hands of one, or one lens, or one mirror. It was power in many. So I began to teach this because I thought that it could be a beneficial practice for children and adults to understand the power that they hold in their hands and that they've always held in their hands. And I developed a kind of system to where I would provide lenses and goggles and pieces of wood. And I would guide children to their focal point and then I would let go and I would watch what they would do. And 99.9% .9 of the time, they were creative with it. 
And 99% of the time when the parents walked by, they would laugh and say, ha ha, remember when we were kids, we used to burn ants and leaves, you know? <laughs> and I kept thinking, I kept hearing that sentence over and over again, and I kept thinking, maybe there will be a day where somebody's going to walk by and say, ha ha, remember that first time we were doing this? We were writing our names, and we were talking about making the world a better place. <laughs> so I started to realize that the sun itself can be a tool for adults and children, a tool that teaches patience and creativity. And if we share it in a um, respectful way and leading by example, we can create a subject, you know, and um, a subject that I believe can be taught in schools throughout the world. And the subject could be called heliography. Helios comes from the Greek word <laughs> for sun, and uh, graphia, which comes from the Greek word to write. And I believe heliography has the potential to be a language, a, a third language, because first is verbal, the second language, music, the third language of light. And this language can have no discrepancy to it. All cultures can speak it, and it can be a way to create dialogue between um, even countries, I believe. And so this, this tool, this tool that I have in my back pocket right here, um, everything in context, right? This tool is more often than not used inside to look at something close up. But when you take this tool outside, it becomes a completely different thing. It becomes a tool, I believe, for self-discovery. And we are reminded of this tool every single day, and we don't even realize it. It's the tool that represents the search, the tool that represents the search for knowledge, the search for truth, the search for somebody you want to speak to, the search for somebody you love. And it's reminding us all the time to pay attention because it can be something, it can be the symbol for the future. It can be the torch, kind of like the Olympic torch, to where you pass off to the children, we pass the power off to them. Because I believe they have enough integrity inside of them from all the years of our learning to create a world that's not full of destruction and they're not gonna follow in the same paths that maybe we did. And this is metaphorically speaking and literally. <laughs> they respect things from the smallest to the largest. And this tool itself can be something that can only be described in that image right there. It's their choice and it's all how, it's all how we hand it to them is gonna dictate what they do with it. And um, how do I leave it, right? <laughs> so my mom told me um, this morning that I need to, I need to feel it. And uh, I didn't, I, I woke up yesterday and I had a vision of my father. And it was of him sitting in the backyard with his feet up watching the sun go down. And he would do this every single night and he would, he'd lean back, he was a big Greek guy with a huge belly, and he'd put his feet up, and he'd light up a cigarette, and he'd look back at me and say, man, I don't care what anybody says, Southern California's the best place on earth. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it wasn't until yesterday morning in the hotel room in Sarasota that I realized what he was doing all those nights. He wasn't just basking in, in the sun um, or reaping the, the fruits of his labor. He was paying homage to the sun every night. He was saying thank you to the sun every night. He was watching it go down, thankful for the day that he had and thankful for the day that he was gonna have the next day. And I believe that the sun can be something that we can look forward to, that can unite us all and that can bridge the gap between any discrepancy that any future uh, conflict may arise from. 
And may this be the beginning of a different interpretation of this tool that we know as the magnifying glass. Thank you.